Hello, uh, my name is Mia Kong and I'm with Related California and we are excited to be here tonight to present uh, Sugar Pine Village and our concept for the sites at the Y uh, on the CTC land. And uh, next slide. I'd like to introduce our development team to you tonight. Uh, we've got folks from um, Myself with Related California, uh, Ann Silverberg will be joining us shortly with Related California, and as Nate Hansen, uh, you've heard earlier, uh, been our coordinator and backbone and putting all this together. Um, we also are joined tonight with uh, St. Joseph's Community Land Trust, Lynn Barnett, uh, and Jean Diaz. We have Jean here tonight. And uh, Robert Lindley is our architect from Studio T Square. And we're also joined this evening with uh, some of our wonderful state team and regional partners. Uh, we've got uh, John Hine from the Department of General Services, might be joining us a little later, Meiji Tabar from the Housing and Community Development Department. And we have from the CTC, Jessica Wackenut Lomelli. Uh, Kevin Pryor may be joining us a little later. Uh, and uh, Amy Rutledge is here tonight. And Chase Javerin with the Tahoe Prosperity Center. And we also have representatives tonight with the City of South Lake Tahoe and the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. We have Hillary Roverud with the City of South Lake Tahoe and John Hitchcock with the City of South Lake Tahoe. And uh, Karen Fink is here tonight with us with the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and Brandy Mahan may be joining us a little later. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, right now, all participants will be muted during the presentation. So if folks have questions, you can type in a question at any time during the presentation. We'll try to answer questions after the project uh, presentation and overview. We're actually gonna be able to have a little bit more of a Q&A session after we've completed our presentation. Um, and if folks are calling into the meeting tonight, you will unfortunately not be able to see the presentation. Uh, or provide questions into the question box, but we will actually have this meeting uh, recorded and we'll be posting a presentation on our website later on uh, after the meeting. And if folks do have additional questions uh, or comments, you can email us at sugarpinevillagestl at gmail.com or visit our website at uh, sugarpinevillagestl.com. And again, our presentation is being recorded. Uh, just again, because it's being recorded and, you know, this is a Zoom meeting, we'd really appreciate it if folks use appropriate language if they ask questions and have comments and, you know, everyone just respect the fact that, you know, not everyone may agree and we may have alternative perspectives, but we're all sitting here trying to listen and learn tonight. And, um, you know, and if we do have any technical challenges, please be bear with us. Uh, we're all working with a safe COVID platform here with Zoom and, you know, we're really actually grateful for folks to spend their evening with us tonight. So again, thank you for your patience and uh, let's get this show on the road. Uh, quickly, just outlining what we're gonna cover tonight. We'll have uh, folks talk a little bit about the state's role and the CTC and the land. And uh, we'll also learn a little bit about why affordable housing is, uh, is critical for the Tahoe region. We'll talk a little bit about our project overview, explain what is being planned for in the development, the site plan, go over some of the architecture, We'll also go over some of our community benefits uh, how, uh, and what we're planning to build and we'll open up for questions and talk a little bit about next steps. So next slide. I'm gonna turn this over now to Jessica Wackenet Lomelli with the CTC. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm gonna start off by providing some context around how these lands were chosen. In January of 2019, Governor Newsom created an executive order in which he wanted to look at the state-owned surplus land and use it to support affordable housing production. Under this executive order, the Department of General Services and Housing and Community Development Department were tasked to implement the order. Within this, all of the lands that were selected throughout the state had to include at least 50% of the units on those parcels as affordable housing and the development needed to be completed within a three-year timeline. A major goal of this type of, um, of this project and the overall executive order was innovation and sustainability. So we wanted to ensure that a lot of the aspects of this project were incorporated in that. So it's really exciting. And of course, we're also the second um, location in the state of California that was chosen under this executive order. Stockton was the first and South Lake Tahoe was the second and there was a lot of excitement around it. 
Um, the Conservancy, so to identify these different asset lands, the Conservancy identified 17 of their lands throughout the Tahoe Basin, and they're located in the urban centers of Myers, Kings Beach, and the Y. These parcels are developable and in town centers and are very separate from our other parcels that are environmentally sensitive lands. Um, these parcels can also align with state planning priorities like SB 375 to implement more efficient land use patterns, infill development, and sustainable community strategies. It also is in alignment with what is planned um, under the Tahoe Valley Area Plan. Next slide, please. These are the two parcels that are located at the Y. As you can see, they're really adjacent to the transit center. It's about a half mile walk to get there. So around eight minutes uh, walking. It's also pretty close to South Tahoe High School and a lot of other great amenities in the area. It incorporates two parcels, which are pretty close to each other. You see the larger parcel is 9.75 acres and the smaller parcel is 1.6 acres. So it's quite sizable. Um, which provides a lot of potential for this project. Next slide, please. I'm gonna go over the project timeline to understand where this project came from and to um, give an overview so people understand how we engage the community and how this came about. In January 2019, as I mentioned earlier, Governor Newsom signed the executive order to prioritize state-owned land for affordable housing. In September of 2019, uh, the Tahoe Conservancy was notified that their lands were selected to be part of this executive order. So that out of those 17 lands that we have, those two at the Y were the ones that were ultimately selected because of their size and the location of them. In October 2019, we started participating in the housing needs assessment with um, different community partners. Next slide, please. In November of 2019, we also began the community engagement process. This was just to more generally understand some of the concerns that people had or some of the opportunities with these two parcels. Uh, we held quite a few one-on-one -on -one stakeholder meetings to understand what sort of amenities they would like to see at this space in addition to housing um, and what types of housing also. In December of 2019, the Conservancy, along with the Department of General Services and Housing and Community Development Department, hosted a community engagement meeting at South Tahoe High School. This one also was pretty general where people got to walk around, um, place post-its on the maps to understand what their needs were and what they um, envisioned for these particular parcels. In January 2020, the request for qualifications was released. This was um, released throughout the state and the country, so we had quite a few developers uh, from across the country who applied to develop on these parcels. They all had a lot of different ideas um, for these parcels, and in February of 2020, out of that long list of developers, we selected a shorter list. Um, in March 2020, the request for proposal was released to this shortened list of developers, who really aligned with what was said in the community meeting that we had in December and really understood the Tahoe environment. Next slide, please. In April 2020, we had our second community meeting and because of COVID, we also had it in a digital format, so it was online. You can actually access it on um, the Conservancy's website because it was recorded and we also have notes from that meeting about like the comments people provided and what they were thinking and what they really liked. Um, this was also incorporated into selecting the final developer. So all of the community engagement until this point, we was really a guiding principle for the state team to understand what the community envisioned for the area and what they needed. And in May, 2020, those requests for proposals were due. In July, 2020, we had the final selection of developer who is related California and St. Joseph Community Land Trust. Now I'm going to pass it off to Chase with the Tahoe Prosperity Center. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, Chase Jandren, the Program Manager with Tahoe Prosperity Center. And for anyone who's not familiar with us, we're the only community and economic development organization for the entire Lake Tahoe Basin. Um, 
experimented quite a few projects over the years of all different kinds, ranging from economic indicator reports to wildfire alert systems, to now, of course, workforce housing. And our housing goal, will simply put, is that if you work in Lake Tahoe, you should be able to live in Lake Tahoe. So in 2018, we convened the Housing Tahoe Partnership to bring folks together to the table and to focus on the housing solutions that would have the, the most lasting positive impact for our community. And this is, these are the kinds of roles that we take on at TPCs. We try to act as a neutral convener around these big issues like housing. So the Housing Tahoe Partnership was led by the Housing Advisory Group, a coalition representing 17 South Shore region partners that you see listed here. And we got input from the public. Uh, we got technical assistance from consultants. And we created the South Shore Region Local Resident Housing Action Plan. It was really meant to help outline and address the local resident housing needs. So the action plan defines the overall housing needs of our community. Uh, uh, go back to the slide, Nate, please. Um, uh, defines it as dwellings of all types for those who live or work in the South Shore region can afford to purchase or rent, serving the entire range of households and incomes. And so this plan prioritizes a variety of strategies that addresses the full range of local resident housing needs that will be implemented over the next six years. And on this slide, you can see the, the 20 strategies that have been identified and prioritized. Um, and so these, and I'll go back, Nate. So th these 20 strategies are gonna be the primary focus to make an impact to our housing issues as quickly and effectively as possible. I'm not gonna address each of these 20 issues, but I would like to point out if anyone is interested in learning more about these strategies or the action plan in general, then you can access that at our website tahoeprosperity.org. Uh, what I would like to speak to is how this particular project fits into the action plan. And there's two primary com components I'm gonna focus on. First is how this specific project addresses the greater needs picture. And then two, which segment of our community this is going to serve. <clears throat> so this, this next graphic summarizes our community housing needs from both the volume and income perspective. So if you see the big number down at the bottom, 3,290, that's the total number of homes we need in the South Shore by 2026 to meet the current and future expected demand. Of those 3,290, 1,880 need to be below market value. Now, this isn't to say that we need to build that many. This is how many we need total, and that can include things like motel conversions, accessory dwelling units, uh, second homes becoming available as long-term rentals, in addition to new construction. So the goal the partnership set for itself is 150 units per year. This one project would achieve more than one full year's goal and almost two thirds of another, another year's goal. <clears throat> so that brings me to who is being served by this development. And I wanna give a little background before I dig deeper into this. So the, the Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development defines an affordable house as one that a household can obtain for 30% or less of its income. In South Lake Tahoe, 48% of renters and 34% of homeowners are paying more than that 30% threshold. So a household that is considered low income or is considered low income if it makes less than 80% uh, of the area median income. And this does not factor in expenses like childcare, healthcare, student loans, car loans, et cetera. So an example of someone making less than 80% AMI is a first year public school teacher. And it's worth noting that our South Shore needs assessment and my numbers that you see on this slide are gonna be slightly different from the numbers that you might see that the developers would present because their numbers are solely focused on El Dorado County numbers. The needs assessment was the South Shore region which incorporated both El Dorado County in California and Douglas County in Nevada. So the numbers might be slightly different, but. Um, uh, don't be alarmed if you see that. So now looking at the spectrum that resembles a rainbow, uh, this highlights the household income levels of our community. And one of the key aspects of this project is that it's gonna be solely focused on the AMI bands between 30 and 80%. Those are the households that fall in between that very low income and low income spectrum. And frankly, can be some of the most difficult housing to find in all of the Tahoe Basin. And at the time of our study, average rents in the South Shore region for a three bedroom, right about $1,800 a month. And I think as we've all seen in recent months, as COVID has prompted this the surge of people to move here from the congested metro areas, 
our already tight housing market is just getting tighter. I think that $1,800 a month would be a challenge to find right now for a three bedroom. Um, so really, I mean, I think we need projects like this to ensure that our local workforce stays local. The below market rents anticipated with this project, I believe are in the range of approximately $450 to $500 a month up to about that $1,800 a month threshold. <clears throat> so the Tahoe Prosperity Center is very happy to see this type of project coming to fruition in our community. It, feel, it falls right in line with the action plan and what it identified our community really needs and feel it'll add a, a tremendous amount of value to our community and to the residents that are looking for housing. Um, so with that, Mia or Nate, I think I turn it back to you. Okay, I, I can just hop in. We're, uh, we're gonna be having a few survey questions here just to both gather data um, from our participants and then also uh, to break up what is probably a fairly long uh, presentation, not too long, um, but long enough that we could use uh, a, full, a few uh, breaks. So our first question just asks uh, you to um, assess in your, your mind um, the need that you see for high quality uh, affordable workforce housing in the South Lake Tahoe community. So we're gonna launch the poll and you should see the poll on your screen. And we're gonna give you uh, about a minute or two just to, to vote um, and let us know what you think. Our options are there's an extreme shortage of high quality workforce housing in Lake, South Lake Tahoe. There is a shortage. There's some high quality workforce housing, but it can be difficult to find and rent, or there is not a shortage of high quality affordable workforce housing in South Lake Tahoe. And we're gonna give it about five more seconds, to keep things rolling. And we're gonna end our polling and we're gonna share our results. And it looks like 40% of you say that there's an extreme shortage of high quality workforce housing. And 60% of you say there is a shortage of high quality workforce housing. And that's a, the respondents uh, who chose to respond to our survey. So just keep that in mind. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And we're gonna continue with our presentation. Um, and we're gonna... Great, so thanks Nate. Uh, this is Mia again, and we're gonna talk a little bit now about the development concept and, and what we envision here uh, on these sites uh, at the Y. So Sugar Pine Village is really envisioned to be a new residential mixed use community that will provide high quality, sustainable housing in South Lake Tahoe. The project is designed to strengthen the community's resilience and support the local workforce and their children. The village will offer ample outdoor space, trail and transit connections, residential, office space, and licensed childcare. We named the project in honor of the sugar pine trees that once comprised a quarter of Lake Tahoe's forests, and these majestic trees are the world's largest species of pine. Today, however, sugar pines account for less than 5% of the area's forest composition due to logging and disease. So in honor of the sugar pines, we'd like to uh, really do a lot of effort to preserve the trees that we have on site, uh, as well as uh, work with the Sugar Pine Foundation to host a community planting to plant new sugar pine trees in specific locations for future generations to enjoy and appreciate. And, and as many of you know, that many South Lake, work, South Lake Tahoe workers and their families really endure living in substandard conditions. Um, they, they suffer having to pay high rents or they live in places that are not conducive to a stable family life. The lack of quality affordable housing and lack of services such as affordable childcare are primary reasons why people choose to leave Lake Tahoe um, and often choose to decline employment offers even if they are offered employment. Uh, so the housing at Sugar Pine Village is really designed to support the local workforce. And uh, with that, we are hoping to provide about 248 apartments, studios, one, two, and three bedroom homes targeted to serve that greatest need of the community as Chase described, which is working households earning between 30 and 80% of area median income. And recognizing the critical need for services such as uh, childcare, as well as supportive services, uh, the Sugar and Pine Village is also going to have a mixed use component. We will have 
an opportunity for a collaborative of nonprofits to, uh, to work together to be in one space. So it's a one-stop shop. Uh, folks, folks from <clears throat> both the, the, uh, the, the, the resident population as well as folks from the outside will be able to have uh, supportive services all in one location and also have the ability uh, of affordable childcare nearby. Um, and we really hope that this nonprofit office space will provide not only long-term affordable rents to the local nonprofits, but really allow them to advance their respective missions and better serve the community as well as our residents. Uh, and building on the vision of TRPA's regional plan of the Tahoe Valley area plan, Sugar Pine Village has been designed to reduce vehicle trips through reduced parking minimums and plentiful secured bike parking, active transportation infrastructure such as sidewalks and the multi-use trails, and really having uh, the class one bike trail and the adjacency to transit really makes this site unusual and exciting uh, to be able to have a walkable community uh, close to goods and services. So our proposal also plans to implement best management practices for stormwater treatment as well as energy and water use reduction through green building design and we also will preserve and activate the stream zone area also on the site. And with that, I'm gonna turn it now over to Bob to talk a little bit about our site planning and, um, and our connection with that bike trail that we just saw. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> thanks very much, Mia. This is Bob Lindley and I'm the project architect with Studio T-Square and this is our, our second major project in the Tahoe Basin. We uh, were the architect uh, for the Kings Beach housing uh, project up in Kings Beach. That's about 77 units of affordable family housing. On this, on this particular site, um, we're very excited to be able to uh, bring uh, 248 units of housing onto these two sites that you see. And we've, we've labeled these our uh, West site, our West Village, and our East Village, but they're really working together as a single, uh, single community uh, focused around our community center located here in the north of the of the west site, and we looked at uh, we looked at trying to maximize our density on the on the property, but also we wanted to make sure we're preserving um, the character of the open space, the pines that Mia mentioned, uh, and really just uh, provide as much outdoor uh, useful area as possible. So in the end, with our site planning, we went from a potential total of 284 units. Uh, down to our current uh, mix of 248 units. So we've actually dropped from 25 units to the acre down to about 22 units. Um, in doing that, we were able to eliminate an entire apartment building and, and create a lot more open space on the site. Um, the, as Mia mentioned, on the, the northwest uh, corner of the site, we have what's referred to as the SEZ. This is a, a stream environment zone. It's sensitive environmentally. Um, it's not, not suitable for development, but we are going to be uh, preserving it and trying to enhance it and also uh, preserve and possibly enhance some of the trail network within that area as an amenity for all the residents as well as neighbors. Uh, our, our site, is, as I mentioned, um, has our front door here along Lake Tahoe Boulevard. We have our main entrance off of Lake Tahoe Boulevard. We are, we are studying traffic uh, to make sure that we have safe ingress and egress. Uh, we'll be doing a traffic study um, to see how, how best to utilize this. But we, we currently are, are looking at three entrances into our main site. Um, and that, that's for many reasons. One is to disperse traffic, ingress and egress, uh, through three different points of entry, and also to provide good access for uh, fire uh, and trash and snow removal. We'll look at that in a minute. Uh, and then the, the outdoor, as I mentioned, the outdoor open space is important to us. We have, uh, we have residential neighbors to the south. We want to uh, invite them into our site. We don't want to create a gated community. So we are looking uh, to create uh, trail connections from both of the cul-de-sacs uh, from the south that can traverse through our site uh, all the way to our community open space uh, and ultimately Lake Tahoe Boulevard. And then within, within that, we have, we have a network of pedestrian uh, circulation, access to our parking areas, and uh, snow removal areas, snow storage areas, uh, and basically trying to 
minimize the site coverage that we, um, we know is very sensitive in the Lake Tahoe area. And uh, by doing a loop, a loop road that's combined with parking, that really will minimize our, our uh, coverage uh, related to parking and drives. So a few of the things we, we wanna look at, um, tree, pres tree preservation, stormwater management, uh, and snow storage are all very important. In the pro we're in the process of preparing a full site survey, including an accurate tree survey, which will identify and locate uh, the significant older growth trees. And as we develop the plans uh, for the project in greater detail, we will be making adjustments for preservation of trees wherever that's possible. Uh, we plan to implement uh, what's called treatment and infiltration at the source concepts for the stormwater management and retention and infiltration for the entire site. So 100% of our stormwater will be uh, treated through bioswales in a very low impact way. Our plan is to direct the water that collects on roofs, parking areas, and site walkways to drain to smaller treatment and retention swales throughout the project site. So. Um, Landscape features like this that that are uh, compatible with with the with the pine forest um, will be implemented so that we have a, a very naturalistic environment. In addition to that, we are planning on including additional stormwater and treatment capacity on our site uh, that would go above and beyond current code requirements uh, to help with the surrounding community uh, to mitigate some of the existing stormwater and flooding issues that we are aware of on the site and the surrounding neighborhood. We're working with TRPA on determining the best way to implement uh, and to what extent these additional mitigation measures uh, can be provided. And then if, if we can uh, go to the next slide. So um, one, one thing I did want to mention is that we are uh, linking with the, uh, the new class one bike trail that will be constructed along Lake Tahoe Boulevard. And part of our community outreach will be to create a bike centric entryway at the near our community building and actually provide uh, through connectivity for bikes both mountain and, and street bikes through the site and and also a way station for folks that are that are going uh, to more distant locales and I'll talk about this a little bit later but this uh, the bike centric nature we're going to be providing a lot of bicycle parking on site and try and actually reducing um, vehicle parking so very, very quickly, our organization, we mentioned, um, you know, our, our three entrances for vehicles. Uh, so that, that's for vehicular and EVA access. But this diagram really talks about our, our connections for bicycles and pedestrians. So every, every building, and this is our, our typical uh, apartment building, will have, you know, two direct accesses off of a, a circulation pathway for bicycles and pedestrians and also direct access to parking. So main entrances to each building um, located adjacent to parking where it's easy for uh, families with kids um, in bad weather to get in and out of their, their apartments. And then, as I mentioned, the major, the major through trail uh, north to south that will uh, basically combine all of these outdoor areas, one, one being our child care center tot lot um, and then we come down here, we've got a, a barbecue area, another children's play area, what we refer to as our, our big green here, um, central commons uh, for, for more active uh, outdoor open space, uh, and then a community gardens, and hopefully a, a dog run. So we're trying to integrate a, a, lot, of, a lot of features of outdoor open, open space. And in this era of COVID-19, we're realizing how important it is to be outdoors uh, so that we can have socializing in a, a safe environment. So we think this is one of the, maybe one of the silver linings of COVID-19 is that we're all going to learn to really use outdoor space to our advantage. And, and that will carry, carry forward after we're through this, <laughs> this COVID. So with that, I think we can take a break and then I'll come back and talk about the building architecture. Thanks, Bob. Um, Thanks. I thought we had uh, two questions come in around parking and um, sidewalk amenities. And we're going to have Q&A at the end, but I just want um, folks to know that we did see your, your question and we can get to that once uh, we wrap up. Um, so we're going to hit our second survey question here um, to keep things moving. Um, and this question has to do with your feelings on the circulation 
and accessibility as presented um, by Bob just now. Um, so I'm gonna launch our poll. We're gonna have about a minute to complete it, uh, maybe a little bit less, depending on how decisive folks are. And the question is, what are your feelings on the circulation and accessibility of the site plan? You love it, you like it, it's okay, or you don't think it really fits in well with the neighborhood. Okay, let's see, we got people voting. Okay. And I'm gonna give it about five more seconds. I wanna keep things open for q and I feel like we're gonna have a lot of questions tonight. And I'm gonna end our polling and I will share our results. Uh, looks like 27% of you love it, 45% of you like it, 9% of you think it's okay, and we have 18% uh, of you, uh, two folks who don't think it fits well with the neighborhood, um, and we'd be happy to talk with you about those concerns once we hit Q&A. Um, so I'm going to stop our share and um, throw it back to Bob, unless, um, Bob, you would like to speak to our parking question, which is uh, the parking ratio. There's assumed that we would have two cars per unit, so there's a question about that. And then also um, a question about sidewalks being installed on peripheral roads. So you can choose to answer that now. Or sure. Move, uh, uh, I could touch the brief on that. So um, if you can go back to the site plan, it would be great, Nate. Great, thanks very much. So again, um, we're looking at uh, coverage is, is always a challenge. Um, we are looking at three-story buildings so that we can minimize our lot coverage uh, while still providing the density that the uh, site zoning calls for. And um, in doing this, we're, we're looking at uh, balancing parking needs with open space uh, desire. So uh, what we're trying to do is to basically right size the amount of parking that we provide for the for the project. So uh, we will be doing a, uh, a study, a traffic study, and there will be an analysis done. Um, but based on our history with with uh, projects that are similar, uh, we th we think we're going to land at about a 1.5 parking uh, ratio per unit, and that is that is less than the the zoning. The zoning is asking for two parking spaces per unit. Um, we're looking to reduce that. Um, we've had some some folks say it would be good to put in even less parking. Um, obviously, there'll be some people who think more parking, uh, but we we think uh, we want to provide the the amount that really works well for the project. And then the other question was about uh, connectivity of the surrounding streets. Nate, if you could. Yeah, it's, um, it's a question about if sidewalks will be installed on peripheral roads, Theta and Delta. We are, we are not currently planning to do that. I think the only uh, frontage development that we will really look at is um, along Lake Tahoe Boulevard. And again, this is where we're creating this sort of bike pedestrian plaza entry into, into the site in the common areas. But um, no, we're not looking to add additional paving. No, there was a uh, one final comment about um, okay. SPS's work in um, places outside of Oakland. I just want to mention that Rob, uh, Bob, uh, did design the Kings Beach development in Kings Beach, Kings Beach housing now um, with Mia. And we're also we're also looking at another site in North North Lake Tahoe uh, at Dollar Creek. So um, that is also an on, ongoing study. So this is this is a uh, there's a couple elevations uh, of our three story. This is our our main uh, residential building. It is a three-story building, and uh, each building will have 30 units, 10 units per floor. Uh, they are non-elevator buildings, so the ground floors will be fully accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, the upper two floors uh, will be served by uh, two entrances, so each entrance basically will serve uh, 15 units, and there will be a, a stair access up to the third floor. Uh, there will be uh, a mail mail delivery area at each each of these entrances. Uh, there will be indoor bicycle parking. I mentioned we're going to do a, a high level of bike parking. At this point, we have over two two bike parking spaces per unit on site, with half of those being in interior bike parking <coughs> on the ground floor, and uh, another half of them being in um, shelters on the outside of the building with um, with roofs. And then in addition to these, this bike parking, we'll have quite a bit of bike parking around the community building. Each floor will have uh, its own laundry. So there'll be um, actually six centralized laundry uh, spaces serving the 30 units. 
and there's some additional uh, personal storage on the second and third floors. Uh, some of the, <clears throat> the larger units, some of the th larger three bedroom units will have um, outdoor open space, private, private decks. And we are looking at a, um, a project architectural character that we're describing as Tahoe Rustic. And that's working with the, uh, the Tahoe Valley plan and their architectural style, which is a, um, a mountain lodge craftsman influence and utilizing very durable materials. We have uh, uh, base materials in some of the high, high um, circulation areas with stone. You'll see this on the community building a little bit more. And then um, a board and batten siding and the main entrances and, and certain uh, highlighted areas on, on facades will be a patinaed uh, steel corrugated material, uh, which is kind of a little bit re uh, reminiscent of, of early mining structures in the Tahoe area. Um, it's, it's really a four-sided architecture. We're looking to develop all four elevations uh, with equal level of detail. This is an uh, example of our small unit. This, this is a small a fourplex building that we developed for the east site so that we could have a, a lower, uh, lower scale proximity uh, to the uh, South Lake Brewing Company. We are, just FYI, we are in development after getting some feedback, we're in development on a, a new two-story uh, building type that uh, combines these together and actually a new site plan for the East Village uh, that will uh, increase our setbacks to the residential on the south and the brewing company to the north. And one of the fe main features, uh, this is a, a rendering uh, of, of the frontage. So here's our, here's our, our drive, drive and parking, our main entrances. Um, care taken for you know snow shed understanding uh, snow shed and removal and and safety for pedestrians is very important as I'm sure you all know um, the other feature of this project we were tasked to create innovation with our architectural um, product and the way we're addressing that is with modular construction so we're working with a uh, company factory OS which is a local California modular company which has its production facility in the Bay Area in the city of Vallejo. Um, we think this process is especially well suited uh, to the short Tahoe building season. It will enable us to work throughout the calendar year and most of the noise generating production work will be done off-site efficiently and with minimal construction waste uh, with union labor and it will uh, limit the site disturbance and really keep our construction site very clean, uh, minimal waste on site uh, minimal disruption to the neighbors and minimal noise. It will also um, really work well with the short, short duration of our construction um, period in Tahoe. Um, a great thing about yeah, this, okay, let's, this, we could go on. This is our um, community building, which is going to be the only building on site that is uh, not modular construction. We'll do uh, standard wood framing for this, and that's so that we can really. Um, customize it for uh, maximum use, and especially creating a large uh, clear, clear span space for our community, community hall, which is directly adjacent to Lake Tahoe Boulevard. Um, <clears throat> this is, we have a front porch, uh, a breezeway. This is our child, child, care, child care center here. This is where we have uh, um, some of our nonprofit community services. Again, this is our sort of our, our front porch to uh, the city of South Lake Tahoe, um, our bike, a bike plaza area, and just trying trying to create a really um, a really friendly, uh, timeless quality to the architecture. And um, so this is this is the image uh, from Lake Tahoe you've been seeing in the background of all of us. And uh, Gene Diaz will be speaking a little bit more about how we're programming that community building a little bit later in the program. After our survey okay. question break, I know we have uh, some, some <clears throat> chat um, comments flying around and, and, a few, and a few questions coming in and uh, a raised hand and uh, we will get to those uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, but we want to keep things moving here with our uh, third poll question, um, which has to do with the general aesthetic and features for um, the proposed concept that uh, Bob just uh, walked us through. So. I'm going to launch the question now, and this is there are two questions in one. And for question number one, you can click multiple um, priority areas, or at least you should be able to. 
And the question is, if you could choose, what features would you prioritize in the project? Would you prioritize accessibility with existing trails, open space, linkage with bike infrastructure, density, parking, nonprofit office space, a community meeting or gathering, gathering space, sorry, or a childcare center? And our second question is, as presented, how do you feel about the general design aesthetics of Sugar Pine Village? You love it, you like it, you think it's okay, or you don't think it fits in well with the neighborhood. And with that, I'm gonna end our polling and share our results. And it looks like uh, the majority of you uh, would prioritize open space, which is a uh, reasonable thing uh, in our current age. Uh, density, parking, and childcare, um, all things that um, we've tried to prioritize here. And as presented, uh, it looks like we're a little bit split. We got a love, we have some like, and we have some doesn't fit in and would be excited to talk with you uh, through those concerns during our q and I'm gonna stop sharing results and uh, we're gonna keep moving forward in our presentation. And um, we're gonna hand it back over to Mia to talk about the projected runs and marketing and Lisa. Great, thank you, Nate. Um, <clears throat> as, as folks heard earlier through Chase's presentation, uh, the, this housing really fits that missing need in the community, which is that hard to serve 30% uh, to 80% of AMI. Uh, and you know, that changes yearly. That's a number that we get from HUD that's based on El Dorado County's area median income. That translates to about 30% of one's income will be applied towards rent. So those figures break down to about, for our smallest uh, studio apartment, about $450 a month up to our largest apartment at eight, uh, just a little over $1,800 a month is what we're projecting as far as the rent range. Again, we're offering studios, one, two, and three bedroom apartments. Uh, the, uh, the efforts, will make a very concerted effort to make sure that we reach out to the local workforce. We actually have a wonderful uh, group of partners that we're working with, nonprofit partners, including the Tahoe Chamber, as you know, our, our partners like um, Tahoe Prosperity Center and the Boys and Girls Club, as well as Family Resource Center and other groups are really going to be working with us to make sure that we get out into the community at the time uh, the projects are ready to be marketed. And so about six months before the end of construction, we will start our marketing phase, which we will reach out to the community, uh, let folks know what to expect, how to qualify for an apartment, and uh, be ready with applications when the applications are, are open. And we do expect that there'll be quite a lot of demand. And so the good thing about our project is because we're phasing it, we'll be able to, uh, to build housing and then build an, an, another uh, set of housing over the, the two year, the two phase construction. So we'll be able to offer units over the course of several years. So we're excited about that. Uh, on our website, we have developed an apartment interest list. So if folks are interested or if you know of folks who are interested in possibly renting an apartment, they can sign up today for our uh, interest list and we'll continue to update folks. And as the project progresses, we will be uh, reaching out and uh, you'll be hearing more about our efforts as, as we get closer to starting construction and then as construction starts to wrap. And part of one of our strategies to allow for our time frame is really to work with the modular construction that you heard Bob talk about. So we're gonna be working with a company out of Vallejo, uh, not very far down Highway 80. Uh, we'll have units being built inside the factory as we simultaneously be uh, building like the infrastructure, like the roads and the, and the foundation work so that we'll be able to um, streamline and uh, really take advantage of our short building season to get as many units on the ground as possible. So with that said, um, our projected timeline, again, this is sort of best case scenario. This is assuming that um, everything happens as planned. But um, as you know, we were selected last month in July, and we are planning to apply for our uh, TRPA and city approvals in October. Hopefully, we'll be able to secure our approvals in February. Uh, just keep in mind, because of our governor's executive order, we really have been tasked to get into construction within two years of being awarded the project. So the only way to do that is to really work very uh, carefully and streamline to get our approvals 
in early part of next year and then be able to apply for financing, secure our financing so that we can start construction. Uh, you know, right now we're projecting spring of 2022 uh, for our first phase. Uh, once we start construction, we'll be pulling the financing together for our second phase and we hope to be starting that construction phase the following spring in 2023. And we expect that um, all units will be completed by August 2024. Again, you know, uh, this is a, a timeline that we're working towards under this governor's initiative to try to get the housing um, built on the ground as quick as possible given the housing crisis that we have. Um, however, we also want to take this advantage to provide community benefits that we believe uh, will be a benefit to the community as well as to the residents. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jean Diaz, who can talk a little bit more about our community benefits. Jean. Thanks, Mia. Um, you know, uh, St. Joseph Community Land Trust is a partner in this, and we're so pleased. We're an independent nonprofit organization, very pleased to be a part of this project. As Jessica Chase and Mia uh, talked about earlier in the presentation, a lot of work has already gone on uh, recently in the community to study the needs, to study what's appropriate for uh, this site as well as the South Shore region. Um, and all of that work has informed this project. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the result of, of our plan is that it includes a considerable amount of community focused benefits. Um, Robert alluded to the, and went over a little bit, the child care facility and community building. So Nate, if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. This is a schematic of the child care center and the nonprofit community center. The child care center, um, it, one of the things th throughout the studies and also our, our individual uh, discussions with community leaders, is that there's an additional need for affordable childcare to support the workforce in the South Shore. So that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, in addition, um, there's the community building that will have three primary components. And right now, these are, are conceptual. It may change, may evolve as we move forward. Uh, but a portion of the building will, of course, be used to support the residential services, the property management uh, residential services for the project. A part of it is going to be dedicated to nonprofit office space. Right now, there are many nonprofit service providers that are scattered all over the South Shore, and it's not really, an, and many of them serve the same clientele, and it's not really efficient to, uh, to serve them that way. So we're talking about a way to consolidate nonprofit services in a way that makes real efficient sense, um, and office space for nonprofits as well. And there's also a community hall at the end there that will be available for a broad range of community activities. Um, if you notice in the front, there's a community plaza um, area that's designated and the bike pedestrian uh, welcoming plaza with the bike repair station and all of those uh, sort of recreational activities. And then of course the child care center has its outdoor play space uh, that's dedicated for the, the child care facility. Um, Nate, if you could go back then. Thanks. Um, in addition to the nonprofit office space and the child care center, um, as Bob went over in his plan, there's a considerable sensitivity to the connectivity to trails in sur the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, we've really tried to focus on making this bike and pedestrian friendly with a lot of the paths and, and integrating into the class A bike um, path that the city is working on. Uh, also, as, as Mia mentioned and Bob mentioned, uh, the sensitive environmental zone, we plan to enhance that and to celebrate that facility, that uh, important facility to preserve the open space, uh, particularly there along Tahoe Boulevard. Um, you know, we've named this site uh, after the sugar pines that once were pretty predominant on this site. So we plan to recognize the sugar pines and together with the Sugar Pine Foundation, um, have some celebratory sugar pine plantings in appropriate areas on the site. And again, we've tried to uh, properly balance density for the residential and open space to preserve as much of this really nice open space that exists on this site. Chase, I mean, uh, Nate, next slide. So community outreach. This is the fourth of uh, specific Zoom meetings that we've tried to target to uh, stakeholders uh, in the South Shore region that might be interested. Um, 
after this, we'll sort of uh, sit back and say, okay, what do we want to do now to further our outreach? You know, with uh, the era of COVID-19, it's a bit of a challenge in how to effectively do that. Um, so we, we continue to have some targeted meetings with, with groups that are, are interested. Um, people are encouraged to go to our website, um, keep informed about the project, uh, send us questions through the website. Um, and, you know, we'll try to figure out, um, you know, more, more efficient ways to try to gather further community input as we move forward. I think, Nate, you have one more question to wrap up this section of the presentation. I do. Thank you, Gene. Um, so we're going to do our final question here, uh, just so we can um, wrap up uh, before we get into the, the Q&A portion, um, which I have a feeling will be um, quite active. So we're going to see uh, what the best way to stay in touch with you all is. Um, we have a number of different methods, and we want to be sure to be able to have effective outreach and dialogue with the community throughout the process. Um, I know that a number of you have reached out via email. so. Your options are email, Facebook, next door, flyers at key locations around the neighborhood, or text message. And it looks pretty unanimous here. Um, we got to share our results. Looks like email is the best way to stay in touch with everyone, um, which we appreciate because we have a pretty uh, active email game here um, at Pine Village. And so with that, we're going to move into Q&A, and I'm, I'm going to give it over to Mia, and then. Um, we can work our way through the Q and A chat box, um, and then once we do that, we can we can open it up and um, folks can raise their hand and we can have a um, dialogue. Up.